is up everybody my name is james d fury and this is black bolt about 10 years ago i was working at a butcher shop in the beaches area of toronto and i left for a break it was like 20 minutes and when i came back the dude that i work with uh, that i worked with he walks up to me and he's got a look on his face that's just like this and he's all like flummoxed and i said what, what's wrong dude and he's like, I don't know how else to tell you this, but there was an Amazon woman here looking for you just now. I was like, what? What are you talking about? He's like, I don't know how else to describe her. She was super hot and she was super tall. And I think her boots made her even taller. I just started laughing and I had no idea who he was talking about until I went home and realized that he was talking about the sister-in-law of my brother-in-law, uh, who, who I once sang um, the words of Paul Revere by Beastie Boys to her guitar playing husband strumming at her house with, with uh, a bunch of people in the family. And so um, her name, by the way, is Karen Cleish. Karen. Hi. Did I ever tell you that story? It's all coming back to me now, but I, I had completely forgotten. <laughs> yeah, I, I did, and, and I was for like, for like the rest of my shift, I was like, "Who is this Amazon woman that came to visit me? I need to find this person. She must be easy to find, right?" Like, <laughs> Amazon woman. Well, whatever. I mean, I don't. I, I what was I wearing? Like, super high boots. I you're don't wearing know. Wearing bitch boots, and <laughs> you're already like five ten or five eleven or something like that, oh, right? So. Nine. I'm just a measly five. Oh, nine. five nine. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, That's how's funny. it going? Good, good. I come to you from a uh, lively and exciting Ottawa. <laughs> yeah, how's Ottawa doing these days? Like you guys, has there been um, a noticeable change in the city since the convoy stuff? Like you know, as have you noticed? Um, like, are people, even though they're allowed to go out, there's less people out? Like, how, how, how is it looking in Ottawa? Because I went to Toronto recently, and I was like, I don't know. There was something different about it. There's like, the people that were milling about weren't the people that were milling about when I had lived there before. It was, like, a different crowd, and I didn't really know how to, like, process it. It was fine. It was just different. So I'm wondering if Ottawa has gone through a similar transformation. Well, I mean, you've been gone from Toronto a long time, so maybe that's what that was. No, yeah, that's possibly but Ottawa, I mean, listen, I kind of live in the burbs of Ottawa. I'm not exactly, you know, in the hub of it 24-7. But um, I don't know if the changes happened because of the convoy or the pandemic. But um, I feel like there's an upswing in Ottawa, actually, because there's a lot more movies being done here. There just seems to be a bit of a cooler energy. You know, Ottawa is really known as like a sleepy town. I've only been here seven years now, but um, I'm not in the thick of it. So I do go out, I go out to restaurants and it's, I mean, you know what, what I say about Ottawa is that we moved here, not because we were like, Oh, Ottawa, we gotta go. It was kind of that, you know, we moved here for family reasons. I needed help with my daughter because my husband was traveling all the time, blah, blah, blah. So we moved here out of a necessity. Um, and it has fulfilled its purpose. It's a great, you know, I work in Montreal, I work in Toronto. So it's a great in between. It's a great home base. It's a beautiful place to raise a family. Done, you know. I mean, it's not like I'm clubbing anymore, right? I'm not dancing on bars like I used to in my 20s. So it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would. I, I want to talk about your career a little bit because uh, there. I, I when I told a couple people that I was uh, having you on the show, there were there was two people specifically. I told a bunch of people, but two people specifically reached out to talk to me about this. Is that your favorite role? That's Mutant X, isn't it? Yeah, that's Alexa Pierce. Alexa Pierce on Mutant X. And, and th is that really what you get recognized for is mostly that role but at, out of all of them? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I so I would say so. It was definitely one of the most popular shows. I've been on a lot of like meh shows that had just like a little bit of a niche following, some bad mm -hmm. sci-fi, 
Um, but Mutant X was actually one of my favorite projects I've ever worked on. I loved every single cast and crew member. I mean, I met my husband on that show. Uh, it was great. I loved my character. I've always loved my characters, to be honest. I've been really, I mean, as a woman, let's talk, like there's not a lot of great, uh, really kind of interesting roles, uh, especially strong women, um, smart women, powerful women. And I've really often, I've gotten to play those roles and Lexa was definitely no exception, but man, did we have fun on that. Yeah, I, I heard it was. Uh, um, I, I didn't hear this. Sorry. Um, uh, I, <laughs> no, I was going to say because sets in Toronto. Um, that's where it was filmed. I'm assuming, right? Everything else is filmed in Toronto. Yeah. The after the the, the like rap parties are legendary. Um, did you, there's probably stuff you can't share, but like, it, it, was there any like was there any like legendary rap parties, or is that kind of scene sort of overblown? It's overblown. You know, I think if we're talking 80s and 90s, yeah, but but no, the rap parties were just fun. You know, yeah, people are getting drunk. There's some people making out. It's just a regular party. And I have to say, when I was a waitress uh, back in Montreal at this pretty trendy uh, restaurant uh, called Globe, if anyone knows, on Saint Laurent, um, I'm telling you, I remember, and I was in the film business at that point, but when there were office parties, like buttoned up office parties that rented out the place, those people got wilder than any Hollywood party I'd ever been at. Yeah. There was grinding, raunchy, there was drugs, there was everything. These office people are nuts and dirty <laughs> and crazy. And everybody that, was just cheating on everybody. So, mm. <laughs> yeah, the smartphone ex like probably put a lot of those parties in check. Like, everyone, I, I keep on hearing about parties where everyone's doing the Drake thing now, where you walk in and you take your phone and you put it in a bag that's like made out of fucking Kevlar or something. You know what I mean? Where no one can like, you know, start taking pictures and, and, and <laughs> well, got, all, I, all I'm going to say to that is I'm really grateful that there was no cell phones back oh my in my God. day. When I was Dude, partying. I was a rave. I was a rave promoter. Are you kidding? Oh. Holy shit. There were no. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm probably already all, all over the internet without even really knowing <laughs> it. You, know? but you never know. Um, I heard you once say on an interview that you often play tough girls who have a good heart deep down inside. And I was, I, that's true because I, I looked over your IMDb and it's just, that's what you played a lot. How much of that though is the real Karen? A lot of it, a lot of it especially was. Um, I have to say that motherhood softened me up a lot. Um, but before then, um, I would say that I played those characters. The reason why I got those parts is because I understood those women super well. You know, I was raised by a sergeant daughter in a bit of a dysfunctional, <laughs> abusive household. So that really, you know, where, where weakness was punished, weakness was not encouraged. And he raised my sister and I to be very, very tough. So looking back now, I'm so grateful. I, you know, he's passed away for many years now, but I am very grateful to that because I, I really attribute a lot of my success in my career and the type of roles that I was able to, to land is because of that. Um, I knew how to act tough and to wear that as an armor, but inside, like I'm the most sensitive like uh, person and I learned to cover that up and to disguise that with toughness. And so I end up booking those roles all the time because not a lot of women and girls are raised like that. Um, I was, so I just knew, I knew how to play those so easily. So I never played like tough girls with no, you know, that's not interesting to watch just like a bitch or just like a tough girl. Yeah. I, Especially I, with that accent. I mean, you know, <laughs> what was that? What am I from New York? All of a sudden? <laughs> I'm terrible at accents. My Brooklyn tough girl, you know, there's too many of those. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't know. I think that it was uh, a blessing from my childhood that I, I knew how to play those roles. I really find them interesting um, I because I really, my feminist side really stays away from like these stereotypical, like, yes. hee, you know, uh, women aren't like that. I'm telling you all, you. anybody listening, those who are like that are pretending to be or are conditioned to be. But inside we're a bunch of ragey, um, <laughs> angry women that may not have been in touch with it yet. So <laughs> I was here to represent. <laughs> I can tell you our mutual friend, my, uh, the mother of my children, she's right in touch with that rage. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> serious. Like it's just not, it's just, it's a very uncomfortable thing that especially a lot of men don't like. Uh, so, you know, we repress that. We pretend that we're not. And, and there you go. I would take rage over, um, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> 
<laughs> my husband says the same thing. He loves that side of women. And a lot of my, you know, my really good guy friends agree. They, you know, it just depends, right? What's your, what's your, what's your, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not your motivation, but what's your ulterior motive when you do like that quality in someone, right? And vice versa. Yeah. You know, do you like them because you can control that? And when you can't control something, that really angers a lot of people, right? So. Yeah. Um, I also want to circle back to something that you just said, because it is pretty rare to hear somebody say that they grew up in kind of dysfunctional uh, household that made you tough. Your dad was strict and all that kind of stuff and then express gratefulness for it. Yeah. Can you expand on that and tell me what you mean? Yeah. Um, I've always been, I mean, my other career choice was psychology. So I love analyzing the shit out of things, but um, I, you know, it, it, I, I think that in life, I always see, you know, life hasn't been easy in a lot of ways for me. Um, I can see a lot of, you know, that my adversity uh, became real gifts in my life um, in terms of tools and skills that I acquired because of them. So I don't know, there's something about me that's able to, you know, quote unquote, make lemon, lemonade out of lemons, but mm -hmm. I really see the positive outcome of the adversity that I went through. And I don't know if that's just the way that my brain works, the way that I like to see it. I've been to therapy. I read books. I'm really all about making sure that I get it right in this lifetime and not waste it because I could die tomorrow. And I want to make sure that I've really understood what I'm here to do, what I'm here to understand. So it's much better than being angry. I was really angry as a teenager. I was very, very angry at my dad and, and men, but he died when I was 18 and that freed me from that. I believe that he was my guardian angel from that moment on and we were able to connect instead of, you know, being all human and shit and being like, he never apologized to me. Um, that again was a gift to me. So I don't know. It's just the way that I, I see life. I, guess. I, I, I actually, I'm a recent uh, adoptee of that, uh, or an adopter, I guess, of that philosophy. Um, you know, if, not being able to change the past is one thing. Uh, and, and I guess that's the first sort of step. And then the next step would be, how do I take the ingredients from my past and find a way to shine a different type of light on it so that something grows into the now and that I can utilize for my overall growth. Yeah, because right? you, see, you see that in life. You see people who are staying stuck in the victim mentality or the anger or whatever, and that's not, it doesn't accomplish anything. It actually stunts you and it doesn't, it's not beneficial, so. That's true. And yeah. also you can utilize that strength when you get murdered in the movie Saw, like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I never look better. <laughs> no, well, hold on, because that person is still this person, and you're gorgeous, obviously, right? <laughs> yeah, but but it's funny how that person can also be that person. So, this way, hold on, hold on, <laughs> and then rawr, like this. <laughs> it's the two sides of Karen. Yeah. Well, this is the third. This is the third side, which I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's um, yeah. Listen, that that's lighting and makeup, dude, and a little bit of you know, like that's that's the magic. Oh, I've seen you in real life. You're you're stunning. Like let's not be <laughs> modest about it. Like you know, uh -huh. it, it, you're 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 clearly a good looking good looking woman, but you're also very talented, and um, you have. Uh, and I want to know if this is pandemic related because I actually, I think I asked you, but I don't remember your answer, but um, you, you had, you, so you were, you were acting in the early two thousands, you were on series and movies and things, and then you took a break to raise your, your daughter. Yeah. And um, that was like 10, 12 years or something like that, where you were, where you, you took a lot of time to, and I think I applaud you for that because um, a show business mom who's always on the road is, is probably not good for kids. So I, I think that's awesome. But did the pandemic lead you to your current uh, career? Because you're, you, you're an entrepreneur now. You've, you've been able to translate your, your gifts into teaching. And I was wondering if that is a, uh, an offspring of the pandemic. Yeah, you know what? It absolutely is. Because um, when I was, yeah, so I took all those years off, uh, basically stopped auditioning, left the business, but I was doing a lot of voice work. So I was still, you know, uh, voicing commercials and radio and TV. Uh, I would get offered some parts once in a while, so I would do them, but I was not actively in the film business anymore. And so when the pandemic hit, I had already started a career in advertising and marketing and sales. And I had uh, event management. I really am just someone I, I don't believe you're ever just one thing. So just go and explore all of your talents, all of your interests, right? So I did that and that was really great. So I was kind of at the height of that and then the pandemic hit and I lost everything and including voice work, everything just stopped. And so there was a year there where I was like, oh shit, like, 
how long is this going to last? What am I going to do? I'm now in my mid forties and I have to reinvent myself again. I just spent five years reinventing myself and it was going well. And now I, you know, so that crushed me. And to be honest, I fell into a little bit of a depression and I was really sad. My daughter was homeschooling at school, uh, at home here. So I was kind of stuck with her at home 24 seven. So everything just like, you know, imploded. And then, you know, a year later, I just decided, okay, I got to snap out of this. I got to just find a way. So in 2021, just stupid little things. I say yes, really often to stuff. So any opportunity that comes to me, I just go, yes. Even if it's not the thing that I'm going to end up doing, or I want to do, I know it's going to be a stepping stone. I just somehow feel like just say yes and see what happens. So long story short, I was going to start this caramel company, <laughs> this vegan caramel sauce company from my house. Cause I love cooking and I love the kitchen. So I was going to do that. And then that just kind of, you know, long story, I'm not going to get into it, but just kind of, uh, stepped, it just kind of like ignited a fire in me and an entrepreneur fire in me. Um, so I started doing that, never came to, never, nothing ever came out of it. But at the same time, I was asked to start teaching on Zoom, this acting school uh, here in Ottawa, who I actually know the founder and owner from our Montreal days, we're the same age, but he used to be a casting director in Montreal when I started my career. So I was like, what, what are you doing in Ottawa? Anyway, so I, when he asked me to teach, I was like, how, what what qualities do I have as a teacher? I don't have any skills. I was going to say no. And then I went, no, don't say no. Just say yes and deal with it. So I went, listen, I have tw over 20, you know, three years experience of acting. I'm sure I have something to contribute. You know, I find that such a typical woman thing to do. It was like, no, I'm not qualified. No, no, no. I don't know what to do. Um, so I just got on my first Zoom with this class of 30 people and they did scenes and I just redirected and I was coaching them and then they actually got better and they lit up and it was just like, oh, my heart just felt this big. And I just was like, holy crap. people I on Zoom. Yeah. Like, holy little, shit. That's like yeah. a Mormon Brady Bunch or something. That, that's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> So yeah, so we just we just started like that, and then when the the school opened up again, things started opening up. Um, I started teaching in class, and and I've been doing that ever since. I do that maybe a few times a week. I coach self tapes, I private coach actors. Um, you know, even in in, in all in, in the U.S., I'm on a website that where people you know hire me to do voice coaching there, and that's just opened up a whole other side of me where I I really love. I don't know if you've read this book. It's called um, From Strength to Strength. Anyways. Okay. Pick it up. It's basically paraphrasing. Um, don't don't quote me on this, but it's basically how as we get older, with the part of our brain that used to be, you know, like super ambitious and like me, 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 my ambition. As we get older, the 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 part of our brain that was that kind of gets a little bit smaller, and the part of our brain to like share our wisdom gets bigger. Mm -hmm. And what if we don't honor that part of our brain, part of our mind? we actually become more unhappy. So when we do start to transition into sharing our knowledge and, and, and teaching, that's where, instead of being stuck where, where I kind of got stuck in the pandemic, I was like, oh my God, I used to be so, uh, I used to, nah, 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 nah. And, and that's where you can kind of get into a real shithole, right? Of yeah. feelings. And instead of going there, I went, okay, it's, it may never be that again. I may never be that girl that was 26, the height of my career but it can be something else that's just as rewarding, if not more. So that's kind of how that started. I'm actually teaching. Think, <laughs> yeah, it's funny that I could easily see you as a, as a teacher because um, I don't know. There, it require it does require, you're right though. It does require a weird selflessness. Like it's like you, you're kind of straddling that, um, that line between selflessness and confidence, right? Like it's, and they're not the opposite or anything, but, it must have taken a little bit like that's being thrown by the way into the shark pool because oh, yeah. you, you go from never teaching to be like, okay, here's your first class. And there's 31 students from all around the country. You're like, holy shit. What the fuck am I supposed it's to true. Do with that? It's true. And some, some are looking at you like this, Oh, you know, can you, can, can you like turn off their camera so they can't see the grumpy ones? <laughs> well, in person, I mean, I've seen, especially when you're teaching teens, they're a bit like this or some kids are like yawning, you know, <laughs> but, um, but then you just, so that that's where the confidence comes in. And that's what I've learned even in just the year and a half that I've been doing this, I'm getting better at teaching um, and ignoring that, not taking it personally, and then just seeing them light up. And then also actors that you're kind of like at first going, Ooh, what am I going to do with this? This is, I don't know if we have any instincts here. Seeing them get better after a few months of training is so like my baby birds leaving the nest, you know what yeah. I mean? And not at one and never at one point. And I think this comes with maturity and being older now. Never do I go, 
there's no jealousy or envy at all when there's successes. I'm just like really in full 100%. Like, let me teach you how to be successful. Now go, go. I don't care about me anymore. It's not about me. It's about you. And I'm so happy. I feel like they're my kids. You know, it's like this unconditional love it sounds so cheesy, but it's true. No, I think it's, I, I totally get what, what you're, what you're talking about because, um, and also, uh, I took an acting class once uh, by a friend of mine, really good actor. Um, he, he, I don't think he acts anymore. His name was Troy Skog. And uh, he's also an acting coach as well. Uh, he was funny. He's like, he got he got a part in the movie Finding Mahomey, Mahoney. Remember that movie with uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman played a gambling addict from Montreal? Oh, no. And, um, and he, he's like, he was so excited. He was like, I'm, I'm one of the like co-stars. I'm, I'm in it for like... 14 minutes and it's great this is awesome and then he got his whole character got cut but you'd see him here and there in the movie just standing beside <laughs> like an extra main characters, right and he's like there i am and you'd pause it and i'd be like oh yeah it's great. It's good. <laughs> Dude, he's like, wonder- i swear i had lines i yeah, swear yeah. <laughs> <I'm> totally <laughs> but but he had um but he but he had this acting class and there was like seven or eight of us in the class and i didn't know that this was common until i took this class one after another, he would go up uh, and ask us a couple questions, very succinct questions. And one by one, all of us, when we found our truth, cried. And I couldn't believe it. And I was the last one to go up. And, and, and of course, because, you know, I'm in my 20s. I was a little bit of a dick. Um, still am. But and, and I walked to the front and all, all I have in my head, I felt the same way that I would feel if there was some dude at a party trying to hypnotize people. So, fucking guy's not going to fucking hypnotize me. Yeah. I didn't think I would. And uh, but lo and behold, you know, I, I gave myself to the process of whatever he was asking me to do. And I I actually in the mid sentence, I, I my voice went up an octave like that. And I was like, what the fuck? Right. And then tears came down. And I was like, are you a wizard? You know, but that whole idea, and this is coming from obviously a person who's not even an amateur actor. So this might seem like common knowledge to everybody that's ever acted, but that whole finding your truth thing I found has come in handy for me in real life. When I challenge myself to really like find the truth, why am I angry? Why am I, why am I letting something bother me? Um, you took psychology, you're, you're teaching acting now. How important is that? And is that the nucleus of everything that has to do with acting is finding your truth? Exactly. Like you nailed it. That's exactly it. So when I was insecure at first about starting to teach is because I was like, well, I don't have, I didn't go to theater school. I didn't, you know, I don't, I didn't read any of the, like the, the great books. Um, I don't know any like specific techniques, but uh, I do know human behavior and psychology because it's a huge interest of mine. So my natural talent, let's say, I mean, I did it all through high school. I won awards and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but in terms of like training, I did some like random classes, but the basis of my acting talent just comes from basic human behavior and psychology. That's what it comes from for me. That's how I analyze a script. That's how I analyze a character. Um, of course, life experience. And I think that, you know, my my greatest uh, request to anybody trying to get into acting is live as much as possible. You've got to have life experience to draw from. So go and say yes to life because it's going to come in handy for your craft. But um, so when I teach, I, I I really focus on a couple of things. I always check in with my class at the beginning. I ask everybody how they're feeling. I don't just start right away with like, you know, let's act. And so like straws, you know, I don't, see, I don't even know the names of the teachers. But anyway, um, <laughs> Stella Adler, anyway. <laughs> That's a name here, so I seem yeah. like I'm talking about. Um, you know, I really check in and then I ask them like deep questions because then boop, that opens up uh, a vulnerability in some way. And then I talk about courage and bravery. And so when you have that combination of those two things, that's where the magic happens. And I say to them, if you're not going to be brave, you're not going to be courageous, and you're not going to be open and vulnerable, then forget it. Don't be here. You're going to be faking it. You know, it's going to be okay to watch, but that's not where the great shit happens. So yeah, absolutely. Vulnerability, courage, um, and, and, and being honest with yourself, you know, and that's when, when I say I'm a better actress now than I was before is because motherhood broke me open 100%, uh, unconditional love, you know, trust with love, um, you know, everything. That's what made a huge difference. And I'm 50 times better of an actor than I was in my twenties. Um, th- that's really interesting, actually. It, it reminds me of, uh, th- we had a poet when I was in high school come in and he told that someone asked a question about writer's block 
And his answer was so interesting, and especially for like a 16-year-old James at the time, uh, you know, it was so profound. He's like, there's no such thing as writer's block. He's like, writer's block only exists if you attempt to write something that, for example, is really depressing, but you're on top of the world. Right. And I was wondering if acting is sort of a similar thing. Like if you're, if you're tasked to do something that's really dark and dramatic and you feel like you don't have a care in the world, do you have to find a separate truth from what you're experiencing in your present in order to like nail that scene, for example? Yeah. Like it's hard to, you can fake it. I have faked it before on, you know, on some of my shows where I couldn't get to that emotional space. Um, and it's okay. It, it can do the job. If you're good at it, it, it'll pass, you know? But so when I say to people who can't get to like, they don't have a dark place to remember, they can't get there emotionally right now. Sometimes I say, you know, your body, the body mind connection is really important too. So you got to be in touch with your body. So sometimes I say in order to trick your, your emotions to come out, use the butterflies in your stomach that you may be having at the moment, turn them into anxiety, feel the fire in your belly and start to like, like stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. As you're, you know, saying your dialogue, you're doing, you know, there's nothing, it's not showing that you're doing that in your face, but stir up the fire in your belly. And then, then maybe that's going to stir up some emotion. We all have some dark shit. We all have some pain in there. There's no way it's impossible to say that as a human, you don't. So mm -hmm. whether or not you want to access that is, is up to you. But yeah, I think that you have to be in touch with that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's funny. I I I've talked about this once before on the podcast, but I can cry like that, and it has nothing to do with the past, but anxieties for what could possibly happen, especially when it comes to kids and stuff like that. Like I go to the darkest place imaginable, mm -hmm. and I just do it for my own experimentation. I just want to know if I I just wanted to know if I could do it, and I can do it like in a second now. Like if I imagine something really awful, like imagine I can't use myself as the example because I don't want to cry on the podcast. Yeah. But <laughs> say, say, say I'm gonna make you a, cry. Stop being so dark, Karen. Um, but say there was like, say there was like a, a, a man or woman who um could cry when they imagined their daughter or son being kidnapped, and that's what I'm talking about. Like, and, and I feel like, like I have to like, then I have to like shake it off for like an hour. I have to get myself out of that place for it take, and it takes like an hour. I can't just do it, and I don't know what I'm doing. And it's so funny. I was gonna write this whole piece. It was like. Am I an actor in waiting, you know, or something? Yeah, like that? Well, because it sounds like you're very in touch with your sense sensitivities. I've always wanted your... to be an actor. Can you <gasps> break into the acting uh, industry when you're 46 years old? Like, is that possible? Well, well, I was going to make a joke. I'm like, come to Ottawa, come to my classes. <laughs> I think I will. I'm going to just be, I, I'm going to go in character as the grumpy teenager, though, just to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you break into it? I'm going to say yes, because you're a man. So yes. <laughs> Um, and then actually last year, I, after this long ass break, I took, I called up my agents and my managers and I said, do you want me back? I want to come back because uh, teaching acting, it, it, I fell in love with acting again. And I said, talk about being our authentic self. Um, I literally, uh, I had to be honest with myself last year and say, you know what, I'm not done with this. And, and I need to explore this second half of my life as an actress again. So everybody said, yes, come back. And thank goodness, you know, all this, it's all the same casting directors that's been around for 25 years. So they knew me. So it's not like I had to break in, but I did have to break in with the networks and producers There's a big changeover. No one knew that who the hell I was anymore. Right. Nice. I'm older now. I'm different. I'm not doing those kick-ass action roles anymore. Um, so it was a long, uh, 99 auditions. I think I did before booking anything. Wow. And Here's the kicker is that in August, I, I, July, August, I was doing a lot of like soul searching and I, a lot of work on myself and I had to come to terms with a lot of like authentic feelings that I, that were scary. <clears throat> and so when I made this shift in my head that I was like, oh my God, I have not been living authentically. I'm not being honest in a lot of ways. I need to go back to my roots. Uh, boom. I booked four movies in a row. Wow. Plus two that I couldn't do because they were conflicts. And I was like, if that is not a life lesson yeah. in the universe going like this, the universe is literally like this when you're being fake or you're not being, I wasn't being fake. I just was repressing who I really was and being like, well, this is who I am now. No, it's fine. It's good enough. And the universe was going, no, no, nothing's going to happen until you fess up. 
And once I did, the universe was like, here you go. There's yeah. the magic. And it's been like that ever since. Crazy. I know that that's first of all, that little uh, thing that you just did is if they ever do like a reboot of Leave It to Beaver, you could be June Cleaver in a second. <laughs> like just fair. just to let you know. Um <laughs> but it's funny how much I didn't know we had this much in common. But and and specifically the uh, and I, I never described myself the way you just described yourself, the authentic self trying to come out. But w- when the pandemic came, I I literally made a decision where I was just like, because I've been, I, I've been, we've had very different lives. I don't think that we actually are a lot alike um, in a lot of ways, but there because I think that you were a harder worker when you were younger than I was, and so I had this sort of slack kind of like vibe, and the pandemic was like this sort of wake up call where I was like okay, they just told us we're going to be locked down for X amount of months. Who knows how long will last? Now I have X amount of months to do all the things that I should have done in my 20s and 30s, and I'm going to do it now. And I have not looked back, and it was the greatest decision I ever made. And even though I had people, and you probably have had this too, people whispering in my ear, dude, just get like a normal job. Why, Why are you trying to be a podcaster? Why are you trying to write books? You know, what's going on? And I had to really, like I had to, smash that voice's face against the brick wall in my head and then get to the other side of that wall, you know? Um, Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, that wasn't a new concept to me. That was always, you know, the, those voices that people, you know, even from my own mom, who's sweet. I love my mom. She's the greatest, but you know, it's weird to, to, to leave universe. I left psychology at Concordia to go first all model in Europe and New York and LA and then, and then start acting so a lot of people were like, oh, so when are you going to go back to school? I remember I had just wrapped my sixth lead in a TV series and my mom was still asking me, um, so are you going to go back to school? Like, you know, like that. So that that whole part, I'm used to that kind of mentality. Like I'm used to those questions, but that's great that the pandemic actually kicked your butt into gear. Yeah. Uh, you know, like some people that happens with like, you get an accident, you break your leg and then you go, oh my God, like, you know, I can't waste time anymore. I never wasted time. That is one thing about me. I've been hustling and working since I was 13. I worked at McDonald's for six years. You know, I just like, I never stop. I I just feel, I don't know, maybe it's a money insecurity thing that we grew up with. So I always feel like, well, no one's going to pay my bills. I don't have money coming down the pipe from rich family members. So I got to hustle, you know, so I have a real hustler mentality that I have to, I have to admit. So um, yeah, the I- hustling part we have in common. I, I've always been a hustler. It's just that I never knew what to do. I kn- you know what it was? I never knew how to take a success and like use that success as a step to something else. I The success would happen and then it would fade away and I'd just be sitting there like, well, I don't know, let's go do drugs. You know, like... I- <laughs> Wow. Well, I, th- I think maybe because I am an actor, you know, so I'm an artist, blah, blah, blah. But I'm, I'm not like your typical artist that's like, ooh, you know, like that. I have a real business brain mm. in a way. Like I have a real like manager brain as well. I don't know. So I always I, I kind of did know how to. And I've gotten better at it too. I wasn't saying I was always like that, but I do that with my friends. When I worked in sales, my job, say, let's say just selling ad space for a magazine was just like, sell the ad space, collect the money, get my commission, boom. Yeah. But I always did more. I was always like, hey, why don't you open up an Instagram account and then do it? For, and I was, oh, I started consulting for free. Uh, no one was seeing me, but I, I enjoy that. I enjoy forcing myself and people to maximize their life. You got one shot. I have this shit tattooed all over my hand. Like it's all like, it's not a dress rehearsal, you know, just like take it. So I will motivate you anytime you need. Call me. I will in the button. Deal. (laughs) Deal. Um, And then tapping into inspiration. Um, I talked to you about this and I asked your permission to, to sort of talk about this. So thank you for saying yes. But you went to Dawson College and you spent a lot of your youth in Lac Mégentique. Oh my God, you butchered that. (laughs) <laughs> and now uh, auditioning for the role of the guy who can't speak French, James D. Fury. Um, sorry, how do you say it? Lac Megantic. Megantic. Okay. Um, anyway, so that was a bad time for, for a laugh line. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but both of those places are, are, are associated in the ether of the um, – of, 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 Canadians that aren't from there or didn't go there 
as two of the most tragic things that have ever happened in this country. And, you know, I, I'm, let's start with Dawson College. When you went there, was that sort of um, uh, the tragedy that happened there with the shooting? Uh, was it something that, uh, you know, was a part of the psyche of going there, I guess, is the question? No, because it happened after I went there, right? Oh, so, it did it? Yeah, because I was at Dawson in 94, 95. Oh, shooting what did uh, 10 years after 15. When look it up, 2006. Huh? Somebody's 2006. Yeah. So oh, I thought it was a lot earlier than that. No. Yeah. So see, it was yeah, yeah, 10, 12 years um, after. So no, that wasn't a part of uh, of of my experience at Dawson at all there. Um, but the Lek Meg Out Sick train explosion, right? I'm sure Canadians have heard about that. But oh, yeah, yeah. So that was. I didn't grow up there, but my two sides of my family are from there. I would have been born there had my dad not been transferred to Sitzil, which is where I was born in Northern Quebec. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's a lot of big tragedy there. Very, very close to home. Um, okay. The pandemic. I, I wanted to talk to you a bit about how that, because obviously it is the transformational moment of our, of our era uh, more so than nine 11 more so than the financial crisis. Um, and it has weighed on families and friends and relationships and people that have been like besties their whole life now don't talk to each other. People have been divorced because of their, um, because of the division inside the household regarding the politics. Have you been spared that or have you experienced that as well? Yeah, I experienced it uh, pretty close to home. And then also two of my best friends were on the other side as well. They were more like, you know, the anti-vaxxer side, the anti-mask side. Um, and again, to that, I was like, with my two best friends, it was like, we had healthy debates. Uh, we mm -hmm. still loved each other through it. Never got into any fights at all. There was actually a respect on both ends. I secretly was like, the hell you're, you're nuts but, but i kept that to myself oh no so i even actually vocalized it but it never affected our relationship because to me you can have i'm a very opinionated person i have a lot of strong opinions about stuff people do not agree with me but but when your opinions cause pain when your opinions cause uh trouble for people and you're um accelerating the issue and adding to the problem like let's say adding to the spread of COVID. i don't know whatever that pissed me off and especially mm -hmm. i was coming from my husband and i both are self-employed we're gig workers we were the most vulnerable of the bunch because we weren't like i mean here i am in ottawa surrounded by government workers that were like getting paid a lot of money to sit at home and like suntan during the summer. And that was really hard to watch. I got a little bit bitter. I have to say that did not help with my feelings, but I was like begging to these people who had those opinions. And I was like, don't you care about people like me who, if I even have the sniffles, I lose a job, you know? Yeah. So there was just, for me, it's just a, a respect that I didn't understand how all of a sudden these people who were like claiming that their stance was coming from a love freedom place <clears throat> were acting the most unloving and the most uh, disrespectful place. And that they never saw that. I was like holding a mirror to their face going, do you not see that that's how you're acting? Meanwhile, you're yeah. saying love, 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 and you're causing a lot of pain for other people. I just didn't get that. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't fall for it. It made me believe that it was much more than, that it was a very political agenda, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, the ripple effect of, of that pandemic will be felt for a long, long time. Um, you know, and um, yeah, I, just, I was I was curious about that because I've I've seen it. I've seen couples break up, I, like couples with kids break up and they both cite COVID as the reason, like the, the divide was just too strong. Yeah, um, you know. like the, the, the conspiracy and, and, and sorry, just to end on this. Yeah. What boggled my mind is that these people who were, say, like, never political before, never really read news articles before, never, I mean, there's a, I'm sure you and I both know, there's a lot of actual real conspiracies that are happening in the world. Yeah. You know, right now, every minute as we speak, we live in a conspiracy, we live, like, there are real, real conspiracies that are justified and real. We live in a world where there's still kings and queens. We do not really have equality. Yeah. It is not an equal world that we live in, blah, blah, blah. But then all of a sudden, when it came to this, they're like, oh, it's a conspiracy. It's just that I'm just like, now you're saying, now you're seeing this is a conspiracy. It's not. This of all the things is not the conspiracy that you should be concerned with around the world. There is 
there was way worse things that you didn't care about before, but now that it's affecting you specifically and humans are selfish, so we're only going to really care about something when it affects us. There it was, you know? So I was like, oh. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know that it was still, um, and I'm probably just naive, <clears throat> but the, the, the whole thing about, um, uh, women actresses or actors, sorry. Um, uh, when they get to a certain age, there's not many roles for them. I I'm surprised that that still is like that. It's getting better. It's getting better. Yeah. I know that when I started, I was, you know, 21 and I was playing a 35 year old mom. Now, you, you, I don't know how old you are now, but you could you could probably play a 32 year old mom. What? No, no, <laughs> really? no. You want to no, watch no. the comments light up as everyone Please. tells you how fucking no, full of shit you are? That's <laughs> crazy. Yeah, that's insane. Um, I'm 46. Um, so I do play a little bit younger than than 46, but it is changing now. I am seeing a lot of uh, mid, you know, women in their 40s that now they actually want you to be 40, like early 40s, let's say. Mm. Instead, back then they used to only pick 30 year olds to play 40 year olds. So there's a shift. You're seeing a lot of it on on TV shows where there's like actresses or you know there, there's lines on their faces. There's actual like more real 40 year old women out there. So there's a slow shift. It's Jamie Lee Curtis paved the way for actors like you who started off screaming and getting their heads blown off in movies and television shows mm -hmm. and then went on to become like amazing, um, you know, female uh, lead roles that she would play. And she never got any plastic surgery. Yeah. Right? I mean, so it's, it's, I, you know, like, again, I never want to judge anybody for doing that because the thing is with women and plastic surgery or, you know, Botox or any kind of like little adjustments that that we do it's it's because with women the the thing i'm not saying plastic surgery for me but anyways mm -hmm. um the thing that 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 puts us in a that traps us is that our beauty our looks is a commodity so do we want to pay our bills or do we want to be pretty and like get the job and you know what i mean so that's the trap that's the thing that men don't have to worry about so in, in terms of equality, women were always like, we're like, okay, now it's kind of getting equal, but then we have to do all this stuff to then make half the amount of money as our, our male co-stars, blah, 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 you know, and do that. And it's just this endless cycle where we can never really get ahead because the only way to equality for women is financial security. And so I'm really, really a big advocate about women having their own money, get your career, bank that money, because when you have money, you can make decisions and you can have power to make those decisions. And that's how the shit's going to change. It's not by like just sitting pretty. It's by, you know, if it means looking pretty for a role, good. Give me that money so that I can, you know, have some power to make some changes. We should write a pilot episode of Sex in the Sticks. Oh, like Sex in the City, except. Yeah, okay. I'm know, sure it's much yeah. more weird and interesting for sure. That's all I got. <laughs> You, you can take over from here. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I can start doing research if you want. Yeah, please, please just do whatever you need to do. No, I just... in the Ottawa verbs. <laughs> <laughs> it would be hilarious. It would be like, uh, not like corner gas at all, but you know what I mean? Like it would be, it, it would, yeah, just the. That's funny that you said corner gas because I just worked with Gabrielle Miller, who was, oh. uh, who was in corner gas. We just did a movie together in Montreal. She's sweet. I hadn't um, seen her in years. Tell me about your new cooking show because I love the concept. The concept was dope when you told me. Yeah. So again, coming back to our authentic self, you know, nah, nah, and so being French, I'm fully French Canadian. I'm hundred percent French Canadian. And that's always been a real important part of my yeah. life. <clears throat> and so it's just for me, it represents joy and laughter. French Canadian culture to me is really like funny and light and lighthearted and joyful. So, and I love Quebec food too. Uh, but now that I'm a vegetarian and my daughter's a vegetarian, um, I was like, hey, how do I pitch this show um, where we take traditional Quebecois dishes, like meat-based dishes, and then turn them into vegetarian versions? And because I'm not a chef, I'm not a professional cook, I'm good. I have some talent there. But uh, so we pitched six episodes um, where I have invited, we wrapped now, but I've invited six chefs or, you know, cooks or, you know, experts in the kitchen to come and help me transform these traditional Quebecois dishes into vegetarian versions. And it was so much fun. And That's it was, awesome. yeah, I hosted it. It was in French. So, you know, it's, it, it is my first language, but it's definitely not something that I speak on a regular basis. So that was a challenge. Um, I loved it. I really loved everything about it. So it should air in the spring to bell five subscribers here in Canada, anybody. <laughs> TV one. So yeah, that was really fun. 
That sounds amazing. What's it called again? Veg Masa. So. so I guess the translation you give is like a make it make it vegetarian. It doesn't have the same zippiness. <laughs> <laughs> thing, thing to it in English, but yeah, so that's the it's kind of a slang because Quebecois is all about slang talk. So quack. that's how they say yes, right? Isn't it? They quack. quack. It's quack, quack, quack. <laughs> you know what the worst part is? I don't speak French. I was born in Montreal. I spent all my summers in uh, Lac Bleu, which is I don't know where. Um, somewhere. Hey, did you say Lac Bleu or Lac Bleu? Bleu. Bleu. Oh, Bleu. Bleu. Yeah. Okay, got it. Isn't it Bleu? Isn't that what Bleu, Bleu is? Bleu. Fuck. You know, I took 10 years of French classes in Ontario schools, and this is what you fucking get. I yeah. get this guy. Right. You need to write a letter. <laughs> <laughs> Not in French, Where's though. That? Where's Lac Bleu? Yeah. How, uh, Lac, it's, I don't know, northeast of Montreal, like not St. Severo. It's not, that's more of a rich area, but close to there, I think. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, what was I going to say? There was something I wanted to say at the end there. Yeah. Sorry. I interrupted you. Uh, but, uh, that's okay. Oh, the ADHD thing. Um, who yeah, yeah. For some reason, I took one class, one Italian class, which I then just dropped in in high school. But I can still say, "Can I go to the washroom in Italian?" But I can't speak any French. Oh, so, nice. Well, that's yeah. useful. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a wreck. I'm a mess. I need your help. <laughs> Are you a life coach? <laughs> well, with my little psychology experience and my acting coach, I can think of something. Yes. Remember, All I right. said yes to everything. Yes. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Let me write a list. Got <laughs> everything, James. Okay. I know. Stop, <laughs> stop admonishing me in front of my people, please. <laughs> Just kidding. Karen Cleese, thank you so much for joining us. This was fun. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. That was fun. Time mm -hmm. flew. Look at that. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. What are these comments? I want, uh, if, you, if you need to pee in Rome, you're set. There you go. That's right. Paso and Dore a la Toilette. Right? <sighs> nice. I know. That could have been anything, okay. but it was can I go to Washington? <laughs> I'll see you at the next family reunion if we ever have one. Sure. Yes. When's that? In another 10 years. Yes, right. Anytime you work like in a butcher that. shop, actually, I won't be coming into a butcher shop because I'm vegetarian. No, so I'll never no, see no more butcher shops. No more butcher <laughs> shop. I don't, what was that? Uh, when uh, Joe Pesci was in Goodfellas. I don't know if you heard this anymore. No more fucking shine boxes, right? Oh, no, that? no, no, no. I have to rewatch no. that. Okay, do it. <laughs> yes, Karen go Cleese, watch Saw 6, you guys. And just so you know, a little uh, hot tip on Saw 6, you guys. I was three months pregnant on that carousel, and I wanted to throw up every single minute. And we were just going oh. round and round and round, and I was three months pregnant. So you were. So this is between takes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was giving birth there. <laughs> oh, God. Well, you are a hard worker. All right, it's out. Let's go. Roll it. Multitasker. That's right. All right, Thank you have a good you. one. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye, Karen. She's awesome. <clears throat> I should have her again, like, all the time. Like, she should become a co-host of sorts, like, once a week. Because, uh, yeah, she's super smart. She's everything, right? She's super smart. She's gorgeous, obviously. She's super talented. She's an entrepreneur. Um, yeah, I respect the hell out of Karen. I am trying to figure out dates for a certain... Oh, I know what I want to say to you guys. Um, on... December 4th. This is big. Have you guys seen the Ukrainian politician who kind of looks like Anna Kurnikova? She's like really pretty. Um, walk around with like uh, a machine gun. Her name is Kira Ruddick. And she, I believe, is the leader of the uh, Goros party, I think it's called, inside Ukraine. She is considered uh, to be in the top 30 of most influential people in Ukraine. She's the second most popular politician in Ukraine next to Zelensky. And I am having her on and it's all scheduled around the blackouts that happen in Ukraine. And also Alex D, um, the, the gentleman that Dean Blundell has on his show is going to be on as well. Uh, that's on December 4th at 4 PM <clears throat> black, white, black blackouts, not, uh, notwithstanding. And then on the 5th, I have Megan Murphy. I have a bunch more shows this week, um, but I haven't nailed down the times for them. But either way, it's going to be a pretty big week here because, um, yeah, I'm really excited about interviewing a, uh, a, new, a Ukrainian politician. I have so many questions. You may have seen the interview uh, with Christine Anderson yesterday. I had fun. The actual feedback has been great. It, it is now avalanched on top of all of the ridiculous criticisms of why would you talk to somebody? Um, which I always hate. 
but um so that went well thank you everybody for sending me messages of support i appreciate that and we will see you next time on black ball thanks black ball black 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 ball Black, 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 black